And you're listening to RN's Health Report. Our email address for questions and comments is healthreport at abc.net.au. I'm Norman Swan, as usual, with Tegan Taylor. Hi, Tegan. Hi, Norman. Now, you've got a story this week on breastfeeding in the times of COVID. I do. So, I mean, having a new baby is exciting, but it's often one that's really fraught with anxiety. And so it shouldn't really come as any massive surprise that that's really amplified during a pandemic. And the Australian Breastfeeding Association has put out some new research on this because their breastfeeding hotline, they've got like a 24-7 hotline staffed by volunteers, um, has had a real jump in the number of calls that they've had this year and a slightly different mix of calls than they'd have in a typical year. So what did they actually find? Right. So they had about a thousand extra calls a month than their normal monthly average, which is um, around about 5,000. So a pretty big, significant jump. And they found that people were calling up with some of the same queries that they'd usually have. They're worried about their milk supply or their baby not gaining enough weight or they've got painful breasts. But there were other things that were that people ask about sometimes, but there was a lot more questions about it this year, like people wanting to restart breastfeeding again, either because they'd weaned or they, they'd they been formula feeding beforehand. Oh, really? And yeah, yeah. So I think people were thinking that they wanted to protect their baby with the immunity uh, that can come with breast milk, the immune boosting power of breast milk. Uh, and also they were worried about supply of formula because if you recall, early in the pandemic, there was a real problem with panic buying. Yeah. And so I think people were really concerned about supply of formula for their kids as well. Yes, yeah, because that tugs your heart there when people want to restart <laughs> breastfeeding after the milk's dried up probably. Absolutely. And so then obviously the, the people who are on the other end of the phone are phone counsellors and they're volunteers and they were sort of talking about that as well. And the other thing that people were talking about was just feeling stressed and isolated and that they weren't able to access face-to-face health services either because they were worried about going to their GP or they just couldn't go because, uh, and this is one of the tugs at my heartstrings, um, a woman who had symptoms of mastitis, so a breast infection, but because she had fever, she couldn't go to her GP because that was a COVID system mm. and there was an overlap there. And and the number of people allowed in the, in the doctor's rooms as well. So a mum with a couple of kids can't go in because he can only have two people at a time. So they weren't able to see lactation consultants face to face? This So these, this study was done quite early in the pandemic, so March to May, and that was a real time of uncertainty and upheaval. I think, I suspect things have gotten better since then. But um, I mean, this this helpline service is there and perhaps there were lactation consultants available as well. But uh, as a as sort of a pre-existing telehealth um, service, it was probably a bit more accessible than, than what came online later. And you spoke to um, Naomi Hull from the Breastfeeding Association. That's right. So she's the Senior Manager of Breastfeeding Information and Research, but she's also a telephone counsellor herself. And she said that the pandemic has made what's already a really hard time for mums even harder. The normal concerns of having a new baby just seem to be amplified, particularly for mothers that were isolated from family and friends. That lack of other adults to talk to, those visits and all the usual exciting things that happen for new mothers just weren't able to happen for those mothers. That's Naomi Hull from the Australian Breastfeeding Association. Was there any sense that, that, I mean, it doesn't sound as if there was actually, but breastfeeding rates dropped during this time? Oh, according to this study, it feels like it's quite the opposite. But the study's based on calls to the Australian Breastfeeding Association. So the implication there is that people are calling because they're motivated to breastfeed. But it also maybe indicates that people were trying to breastfeed, but they um, they couldn't also access the sorts of face-to-face services that they'd usually have. But there was a, a different study in Maternal and Child Nutrition Journal last month of the UK, and they interviewed even more people. It was a similar sort of study. And some of those mums, nearly, it was about 40%, said that they felt that their breastfeeding was protected due to lockdown, that it was better. But there was a pretty big chunk of women who felt that they had less support to breastfeed. And a lot of, there's about a third of the women in the study felt like they stopped breastfeeding before they wanted to because they just didn't have the support available. So I think it really depends a lot on who the mum is. Um, In that British study, mums of black and minority ethnic backgrounds were much more likely to be impacted by the pandemic and stop breastfeeding before they were ready. So it sounds that mothers and babies internationally have been neglected, if you like, in pandemic planning. 
Well, yeah. So another um, expert that I spoke to for this, Carleen Gribble from Western Sydney University, she's studied this and she said she wrote advice to a pandemic, uh, an emergency plan document in 2007, indicating that there isn't enough emphasis on infant feeding in these sorts of plans. And that one of the big holes is that mothers and babies need to be seen as a dyad, as a single unit, and that protecting that relationship and their ability to stay together is really key to having the uh, the ability to feed them as, as their mothers want to, even in times of upheaval. Tegan, thank you. Thanks for having me. And Tegan will be back in the Health Report podcast to answer your questions at healthreport at abc.net.au. If you can cast your mind back to the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, all the talk was about treatments, with President Trump asking questions about oral bleach and strongly promoting hydroxychloroquine, which is now known not to work. But things have moved on. We now know that certain anti-HIV drugs don't work either, and that the antiviral remdesivir is disappointing. And convalescent serum, that's where they got emergency use authorization in the United States, where you take the blood of people who've recovered from COVID-19, spin down the serum that contains the antibodies and give it to somebody with the infection, it doesn't seem to work either. But there are other reports that monoclonal antibodies might work, that blocking the receptor for the virus might be promising, and returning to one of our earlier reports that the anti-parasitic medication ivermectin, we find out that that has not yet fallen out of the race. David Jans is Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Monash University, and his group was studying ivermectin long before SARS-CoV-2 came along. Welcome to the Health Report, David. Uh, nice to be here, Norman. Hello. Now, it was your it was your colleague that uh, did the work on the ivermectin we had on the program, and that was in the lab. Just remind us what you found in the lab there with ivermectin. So we we've worked on ivermectin for over ten years in the lab, and we had worked out what we thought was the mechanism. And I can talk a little bit about that later if you like. But uh, what we did when the COVID nineteen uh, epidemic started was immediately think. I think both of us simultaneously, but independently. Uh, so my colleague, Kylie Wagstaff and myself, thought that ivermectin could work and should work. So, this is because, on, so the work you've been on the previous 10 years was into other microorganisms, not just parasites. You'd looked into other viruses and so on and found some effect again, it, yeah. again in the lab. Exactly. So I'd, we'd worked on ivermectin for more than 10 years on basically other viruses, um, dengue, Zika and so on. And anyway, we both thought it's going to work for for uh, COVID nineteen, and so we did the test uh, in cell culture, and it, it came up uh, as we expected, and and so that's where <laughs> that's where we are, and or that's where we were then. And it's jumped to human studies, but has there been any animal evidence, so called preclinical evidence, that ivermectin can work? So. The, the there have have been some studies about ivermectin, but certainly not for so in animals, but not for uh, COVID nineteen. So ivermectin is known to be completely safe, basically after four, more than forty years of use in humans. Um, you know, one bad interaction in a million, and so I think people. And this is logically... used in the treatment of river blindness in Africa, in particular. It, uh, so, uh, actually for various roundworm infections, so a whole host of them actually. Um, and so the, uh, it, it, people just basically read our paper and I think jumped straight to humans as I think, uh, a pandemic probably, pandemic probably warrants. And so by my account now, I think it's something like 68, uh, random, randomized clinical trials running for ivermectin. Um, and a whole bunch of other what I would call observational studies. And so, yes. So, so, are, so it's running the risk of going the hydrochloroquine way, which is lots of tiny little studies that are not very well designed where you don't really quite get an answer. So when you look at a spread, I mean, how many high-quality studies are actually being done into ivermectin? I, I would like to think that a number of the 68 are high-quality studies, Um and I should add that we ourselves are uh, have been sort of working in the last six months uh, as hard as we can to get to the point of doing a clinical trial ourselves. Uh, so I would agree. I think the sort of plethora of different studies that, as you say, are not very well designed is a problem. But I think some of the studies have been quite well designed and I think the results are starting to come out. 
Um, Showing and, what? And so they show two things, I think. Number one, they show that uh, ivermectin is safe. So as I, as I said before, ivermectin has this amazing uh, safety record after 40 years of use or over 40 years of use. However, it wasn't clear to me that necessarily ivermectin plus COVID-19 would be a good combination. And so I was a bit scared about, uh, you know, uh, sort of adverse reactions and so on. Not a single report that I've seen in any of the studies well, or well, in that, any other That's study. comforting about safety. But what about effectiveness? Because it's been used in two ways. One is early treatment to sort of prevent yeah. going on to COVID-19 and the other is as a treatment for COVID-19, which is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. Exactly. What, what's the evidence showing? So I think the evidence is positive for both. And obviously, we're dependent on then the release of studies uh, that are either random clinical, randomised clinical trials or uh, peer-reviewed publications, and so in just in and so there are a number. There's probably six or seven now that I think are looking very positive uh, in terms of prophylaxis. Prophylaxis, so protect you. You would take uh, ivermectin to protect you against impending infection because you're in a risk group. So a study in Egypt showed that. Uh, two doses of ivermectin were enough to protect most, so 93% of uh, patients who uh, didn't have symptoms but were close family contacts of a COVID-positive patient. And was that a randomised study? It was a randomised study, and in the control subjects, 58% got symptoms. Now, just get down, so, so you're, you're getting positive signals, but we got positive signals out of hydroxychloroquine, but when they did large studies like the recovery trial in Britain, which is thousands of patients in real life in the, in the wards in Britain, you know, hydroxychloroquine fell over and it's fallen over in large clinical trials. So you often get a signal, it's like vitamin D and fish oil, small, poorly conducted trials, you get positive effects of vitamin D and fish oil, and then we get larger and larger trials, they fall over. Uh, I mean, how how much can we bet on this? <laughs> I'm not a betting man. Um, I, I I I think there really is little point in uh, presuming it's not going to work until you've shown that it doesn't work. And I think, unfortunately, um, there are a lot of people who keep saying there's no evidence, there's no evidence. I think there is actually a lot of evidence to suggest, yes, you should do the big trial. And I think... All of the positive results that, so positive results such as the one I just talked about, they are actually much, much better than any sort of preliminary or small study uh, uh, result for, I think, hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir or anything else that I've seen. And unfortunately, with the second wave in Europe, um, they might get a chance to test it. So, so there are random, randomized clinical trials in Europe, in Spain, uh, in France, and so on. So... Um, I think we're all just waiting for them to start release, start to release their results. And when they do, I, we'll know one way or another, of course. But I think, you know, as you say, the big study is what you need to do. But in the meantime, there's lots of people in hospital that actually need a solution. So I think you have to navigate, you know, the, the extreme urgency of the situation, uh, you know, the right way. And at some point, I think, you know, uh, you, you can talk about randomised clinical trials forever. Um, when do you have enough? Well, you never do, I suppose. David, we'll follow this up with interest. Thanks for joining us. No problem. Thank you, Norman. David, Bye. David Jans is Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Monash University in Melbourne.